Good morning, and welcome to the Meridian Adventist Sabbath School in Meridian, Idaho. We are glad that you are able to join us either through uh, in person, online, or perhaps watching a recording. Let's start with a word of prayer. We always want to invite God's presence with us. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> we are thankful that you call us daily to uh, communion with you, to have a relationship with you. We ask that your spirit would guide us in our study today and that your, you will be glorified and that we may better understand how to be good as citizens in the kingdom of heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And my laptop went to sleep. There it is. Ah, so our lesson today is uh, we're on lesson number six, The Roots of Abraham. Uh, the resources that you can use for studying the Sabbath School lesson are ssnet.org. And the other ones you see on your screen, we've talked about these before. If you don't have a lesson, I didn't bring mine with me to hold up. <clears throat> And they're available online. Oh, Barb has one. Good job. Yeah. Oh, she wants it back. I can't keep, I can't, uh, I didn't have it long enough to look through her notes and grade that. <laughs> um, I don't know how to pronounce this gentleman's name. Uh, and you probably can't read the text at the bottom. Although I see there's a mouse there. Uh, this, this, uh, he's a, if you, if you can read the really tiny print at the bottom, it says he makes 10, over $10 million a year as a soccer player. And uh, somebody captured this shot, and you can't really tell because of the quality, but he's got an iPhone 11 there with a cracked screen. Does that have a dissidence in your mind? Earns $10 million a year, cracked iPhone 11. And this picture was taken in the last six months. So iPhone 11 is not the latest model. He was asked about it. Why are you carrying around a cracked iPhone, a cracked cell phone? You, you have uh, lots of resources at your disposal. And he said, why would I want 10 Ferraris, 20 diamond watches, and two jet planes? What would that do for the world? I starved, I worked in the fields, I played barefoot, I, um, I didn't go to school, and now I can help people. I prefer to build schools and give poor people food or clothing. I have built schools in a stadium. We provide clothes, shoes, and food for people in extreme poverty. Does that help you understand why he's carrying around? He's wealthy, and he's using a cracked screen cell phone. He goes on, I just want to note the last part, I prefer that my people receive a little of what life has given me. And when I, I didn't, you know, I read news stories and, you know, they register and then you move on. I thought, well, that's great. He's a great example of a human being and what we would hope for. Because certainly there are people making much more than he does and they aren't giving their wealth away. Although there is a coalition of, of ultra-wealthy people, and uh, Bill Gates is leading them to try and donate their wealth. Their wealth. Their wealth. Uh, no, he's trying to get, he's donating the 90% of, of his wealth uh, upon his demise will be, well, his half, because he divorced, his wife divorced him. That's, the divorce isn't the point. The point is he's trying to get people to do good with their money. Now, they, are, they also want to define what good is. And I, I'm not going to say I do or don't agree. I'm just saying that's part of it. It's still using your money for what you want. It's better than, I don't know, spending how much money so that you can take a trip into space. I'm not saying that's a bad idea. You have the wealth. You can do it. But if you had taken that same wealth, and how much could you have relieved the suffering of people somewhere? And so my question then is, 
is, is this soccer player a hero? Is he a fool? By the world standard, some people might call him a fool. But by God's standard, which is as ye would have men sh uh, should do to you, so do ye to them likewise. And that is a statement from Jesus. So I think that's on pretty good authority. That's God's standard. And we'll just keep that in the back of your mind. And I'm, I'm thinking about this because when we think about the story of Abram, I was having a discussion with a friend of mine, and he said one of the reasons that, that God blessed Abram was because Abram didn't take the wealth and then hoard it. He was looking out after other people with his wealth. He's like, oh, wealth is coming to me? I need to find a way to make that work for other people. And so our next, uh, this lesson and the next two are all about, are all covering sections of the book of Genesis that have to do with Abram. And uh, lesson eight might not be clear, but it will be eventually. What's in a name? At the Tower of Babel, they wanted to make a name for themselves. It says that, you know, we, we need to have a name. God said, go out and spread out amongst the, you know, populate the earth. And they said, we're going to stay in one place. We're going to make a name for ourselves. And Abraham wanted to make a name for God. That's me. That's not in the lesson. That's what I'm saying. And so what is in his name? Abram, it means exalted father. And Abraham, when he was changed in Genesis 17, in one of the covenants he made with God, it means father of many nations. And uh, one of the commentators pointed out that this is focusing from exalted father, which where's the focus? On the father. And then father of many nations, the, 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 it kind of shifts focus. It's no longer, yes, he is the father of many nations, but it's, you could say it's more about the nations. Sarai, his wife, her name means princess, literally. And her name was changed to Sarah, princess of the multitudes, and in other languages, it also means joy or happy, which in their culture, if you were going to be a happy woman, what did you need? What was the primary thing that you needed to give your husband? Kids, more specifically, sons to carry on the name. Because we keep coming back to this theme. We've got to make a name for ourselves. And I did want to note that the name changes in Genesis 17, which this lesson kind of touched on. I'm just going to go by Abraham, because if I have to, in my head, say, Abram, it's, it's not going to work for me. Uh, and then there's one other character, Lot, and his name curiously means to envelop uh, wrapped closely, it could also mean secrecy, which is kind of an interesting, as things unfold, I don't know how his parents managed to name him that, and then it came true, so chicken, egg, which came first, uh, that's an evolution question, I shouldn't use that example, but you can see where did Lot become secretive because that was his name, or was his parents new, or God impressed them, I, I don't know. But if we look, it says, uh, by faith, in Hebrews 11, our famous faith chapter, and we actually covered this in a recent lesson. Do you remember, you know, they talked about in the Bible there's chiasm? Abraham's not actually the first part. He's, he's one of the first ones named. Do you remember in the chiasm who the center was? Because in chiastic structure, it's not, I mean... I typically read a story, and at the end, the end was the important thing. But in a chiastic structure, the middle point, it comes up to the middle point, and then it goes away from the middle point. But everything points back to the center. And in Hebrews 11, the center of that was Rahab. Rahab was the strongest person of faith. Because she was not Hebrew. She was not from lineage. She lived in Jericho. She was a prostitute. 
She lived in, in a city there were, that, that God's people were about to take over. And by faith, she protected the, the, uh, the spies and then helped send them home and said, just save my family. That's a lot of faith. You come and you're in a fortified city that nobody else has managed to breach. She's the one. But Abraham, of course, is listed there as well. And it says he obeyed when he was called and he, to receive an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. So it'd be one thing if you said, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, take a trip to New York and visit my, with my wife and, and visit her, her children. You know, I know where I'm going. Uh, I don't ever remember, not even once, um, going out and saying, I'm just going to go drive around. Now, some people, like my, my first wife, she would do that. She loved just going and exploring places. And I, and I bet my, my wife also would love to do that kind of thing. Uh, but not me. I, I'm like, no, I need a destination. And so here, this makes Abraham sound great. But as we're going to see in the lesson, he was not perfect, which really is encouraging for me. Uh, I found this map on uh, Wikipedia Commons, uh, common media, and it shows uh, Ur of Chaldees and uh, where he went, and then he went down to Canaan. Uh, it doesn't show his trip to, to Egypt. And uh, this is another map I found, a little bit more of a topography. Uh, I can't read it. I don't know about you, but I, I can't, whatever language that is, I, I can't read it. But it does show a little bit of it uh, also from. Uh, Wikimedia. And then here, this is actually Google Maps, because I thought, well, uh, I don't really understand. You know, I know Abraham took a trip, but I need to have some kind of frame of reference. Wh where exactly did he go? And you can see it's, it's kind of, well, obviously, uh, Google Maps today is not going to tell us where he actually went, because uh, those are roads, and I don't think those were the roads he took. But it, it's kind of a, I just, put some points on a map, and, and it actually goes uh, to Cairo. I don't know that he went to Cairo. I'm just saying he went to Egypt, so I picked a place in Egypt, and then he w ended up back. If you have ever used Google Maps, you know that the red dot is kind of where he ended up, and I don't know that Nazareth is where he ended up. I just picked a spot, but it, just generically speaking, you can kind of get an idea. But I wanted to know in my head what was the frame reference of God tells him to, to go, and he, he goes. And so the trip would have been about 4,000 kilometers or about 2,500 miles, something like that, close to it. And uh, that would be a cross-country trip if you went from San Francisco to uh, someplace in Florida. That'd be about 2,500. Actually, uh, it was, uh, that was too far. It'd be San Francisco to Atlanta would be about that line. And it would be a cross-country trip with livestock and... and um, you could also, because it was a there and back trip, because he, he went to the Promised Land and he went to Egypt and back. So I, I did another one, this time again in the U.S., where he went from, if you went from Boise to Waco, Texas, and back to Colorado Springs, which kind of represents the same kind of trip, also would be about 2,500, 2,400 miles, again, giving you an idea, with livestock. I kept putting the, I put the livestock in there part because I think it's important. I mean, they weren't, you know, taking the bullet train or an airplane or some other, you know, modern means of conveyance. They were walking, and he had stuff. So it would, it would take a while, right, to, to go 2,500 miles walking. I have no idea how long it took him to do that. Now, Abraham gets a, a, a command, a, a message from God, go. And it says it's concerning his family. He must leave his heritage and what he learned and acquired through heredity, education, and influence. But an interesting thing, you know, I have some keys in my pocket, so I think they're in my other pocket. I have a key here in this pocket. It's a different key. So I have this key to my car. And uh, so I could take this and I could leave it here and I could go, right? 
I can take my keys out, and I could leave it here, and I could, I could exit. So God's telling him, go. How do you leave your heritage? Can you do that? Wherever you go, there you are. Right? So you can't, you take your heredity and your education and, your, and those things with you when you go someplace. And uh, God's call involves even more. The Hebrew go means go yourself or go for yourself. And I think, I guess it was more in the lesson. Oh, well, this was it. A departure of, of, um, from Babylonia, which by the way, uh, intra, I, I didn't say that. When he was leaving the Ur of the Chaldees, or the, for where the Chaldeans were, Chaldeans were known for their magic and for their sorcery and for uh, not worshiping the God of Abraham. And one of the unique things about Abraham is you never read where he ever got involved with other gods. Uh, maybe he made some mistakes where he didn't trust God, but he didn't ever like join a different church or witchcraft or those kind of things. So good for him. That, that's a really good example. And so it concerns leaving more than himself. It emphasizes that he has to leave himself and get rid of the part of him that contains his Babylonian past. Uh, how do you do that? Like I said, you can't just you know t t empty that stuff and then and then go. You, you take it with you. But the original language is saying, telling us God had a message more than just leave your family and go to this place where I haven't told you where it is. That's, that takes a lot of faith to go on that message, to go on that path. And so the promise is not just about a physical homeland, but about the salvation of the world. This idea is reaffirmed in God's promise to the blessing for all nations. And the word bless in these two verses occurs five times. So I'm going to go back to when Abraham was blessed, what did he do with his stuff? What did he do with his blessings when blessings came to him and he had increase? Did he hoard it? And he's like, ooh, I'm going to, I need more of that stuff. He paid his tithe. He, paid his tithe. he we'll talk more about that later. He used his wealth to help others. So when you have somebody that has a lot of wealth and they're using it to help others, it's very clear, like, like the soccer player earns $10 million, has a cracked iPhone. He's helping the, the people that he knows. In fact, a lot of people, a lot of people he doesn't know. What might God be calling you to leave behind? Do you think what God was asking Abram, Abraham to leave behind was something that Abraham needed? No? Okay. So if God did that to Abraham, if I then take that and be introspective, is God asking me to leave anything behind that's not good for me? Might God do that? Yes, Jerry. Even, even if God asks us to leave something behind and it's something we think we need or it's something that we truly do need, if he asks us to leave it behind, he will provide later on it's not like he's going to ask you to go without and, and, you know, struggle on. He will provide either what you need or something better, but he will not leave you without. He will not leave us. He will be with us through our trials. And I want to give two examples. Uh, the first one most people would embrace, and that is Daniel's friends come up to this test. Here's this big statue made out of gold, 90 feet tall. All you have to do is uh, when the music sounds, you just tie down and retie your sandal. And everything's fine. No one dies. But if you do that, you're also worshiping an, an idol. Simple decision. 
Common sense says, tie your sandal. But they didn't do that. And so they got thrown into the fire and nothing happened to them. And every time I think of the story, I keep thinking, wow, these three young men made a good decision, get thrown in the fire. The guys who throw them in get killed from the fire. Nothing happens to them. They get to meet Jesus and have a conversation, I'm assuming. And then the king has the audacity to say, hey, who is in that? Come out here and tell me what's happening. Like, if you were standing there talking to Jesus, would you want to leave? I don't think so. I, I wouldn't. But he is the king, so you've got to leave. So that one, I love that story. That's a great story. You know, God prevails. What about a second story where there were Christians who at a time, there was a time when the Romans were, had a Colosseum and they would round up Christians and they would torture them and uh, pit them against animals and watch the animals tear them apart. So was God with those Christians? Does that line up with some of the prosperity gospel that we, we sometimes hear? Some people preaching? If you give to God, God will take care of you. Well, what does take care of mean? Yes, Jerry. Joseph and I have had some good uh, conversations and discussions about this. What that means to me is that, and I think this is part of it, but what that means to me is even if God lets you be ripped apart or shot or, or tortured or whatever, okay, I fully believe the God that I love and that I worship, that those people were not, what he did for them, they were not in pain. They were not suffering the whole time. Mm-hmm. It's just like when they burned them at the stake and they would go out singing. I fully believe that that's what God did for them, has done through history, and will do for us at some point in time. Even though we lose our lives, which we think we need, well, some of us do, but um, he will not leave us to die such an agonizing death. Am I making sense? Yes, you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's my He's that's kind of what I wanted to us. go to is that if we think that the Bible teaches if you do A, then God will do B, and then you look read that story about the Christians that were torn apart in the Colosseums, there's a dissonance there. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't line up with that thinking. And the reason it doesn't line up is because prosperity religion isn't, is, a, is a false, it's a false interpretation of the Bible. So that's why there's a dissonance. God doesn't say, if you honor me, I will make you wealthy. Because if that were true, everybody in the world would say, great, I'm going to honor God so I can be wealthy. But is that why God, but, it, but if, if they then take that wealth, hoard it, then God's plan isn't being pu- uh, fulfilled. Thank you. So what part of your life might you have to abandon in order to heed the call of God? Uh, I can't answer that for you. And that's a question that I try and ask myself daily to make sure that I'm on the right path. And like Abraham, sometimes I make mistakes. So why did Abraham leave the promised land? So Abram, we looked at the map. He goes from Ur of Chaldees, leaves Babylon, which is a spiritually significant. He leaves Babylon, and he goes to the promised land that God didn't tell him. He arrives there, and there's a famine. So he starts out in faith, and he gets to the place, and there's famine. And we don't know what God would have done because Abram decided, I'm going to go to Egypt. They have food there. So he goes to Egypt. Yes, Joe? He goes to Egypt, right, because of the famine. And then... 
uh, he's, his wife, I think at the time, he was about 90, I want to say, something like that. I didn't look up the numbers. His wife's 10 years younger than him. Maybe he was 80. Uh, I think she was around 70. That's what I'm thinking. So here's this 70-year-old woman, and he's like, wow, she is such a beauty. Uh, they're going to kill me in order to have her as a wife. So he, what did he, what did he tell the Pharaoh? He said, oh, and this is my sister. Is that, is that all of the information he should have shared? No, he shared the part that he thought would get him off. But it also put her in a vulnerable place. And I don't understand that culturally. I just know that in sometimes Abram's a really brave guy, and other times you're just like, dude, what are you doing? And he repeated this error with King Abimelech later. So he didn't do it just once. And then his son, as we will find in future lessons, <laughs> kind of does the same thing. Do you think Isaac may have learned that story? Yeah, somebody told Isaac that story. I don't think Isaac, not that Isaac couldn't have come up with that on his own. Isaac wasn't stupid. But this tells us, so is this the hero we're hearing about in Hebrews 11? The man of faith lying to two different men of power so that he could save his own skin? No. And yet, in Hebrews, he's listed as a man of faith. So what, you know what that tells me is either Hebrews 11 is wrong or Hebrews 11 is right because God... When we ask for forgiveness, he's like, okay, let's start over. Let, let's adjust. Let's get the path corrected. God is not a, a, a God that is vengeful and a God that is, you know, all about the rules. Joe, did you have something to share? The most interesting part of that story that I thought was uh, God still honored Abraham and his wife by inflicting enormous damage on, on the Pharaoh and his whole, and his whole yeah. family. Yeah, Pharaoh got the message, didn't he? Oh, Just yeah. not from Abraham. And what was that message? They stopped bearing children. Now, I am I not a woman. I have never faithful. Yeah, I was never, I've never given birth to a child. I've seen my first wife give birth twice. And it was not uh, fun and games. It's the kind of thing that wrenches your soul when you see someone you care about in pain. So I'm thinking about these women. I don't know if they not only stop conceiving. I have a feeling it could be. It doesn't say specifically, but imagine the pregnant women couldn't give birth. Just, I love that Ellen White tells us, imagine, put yourself back. I didn't need permission to use my imagination, but I'm glad it's there. And do we ever face these type of questions? Do we ever face these type of things where if we make a decision, wow, it just seems like that's not going to go well. I... Uh, I, I faced a, a, a rather significant monetary decision several years ago, and um, I decided, you know, I'm, I'm just going to trust God in this. And the people we were dealing with, there's no reason it should have come out in my favor, but it did. And I truly believe that God worked in that. And this decision impacted my sons. And when they, they, they weren't, I made the decision, I took the action, and then I told them. <laughs> and they weren't, um, they realized there's nothing that could be done after. A bit like, you know, I, uh, Abraham, as we'll learn, took Isaac, you know, on a trip for sacrifice. He didn't tell his wife. So I kind of followed that plan. 
So Abraham realizes that here he's got this wealth, he's traveling with Lot, his, his nephew, and there's fighting between the two, you know, they're all one family, sort of. Uh, Abraham's the lead, but the, you know how families are. Families, if you have any siblings or relatives, uh, there tends to be some infighting. There tends to be sometimes challenges. And he realizes the only way that this is going to fix this is they, they need physical separation. And so he allows Lot to choose. Here's the land before them. God has promised. I don't know if there were people there or, were, or if it was such great land, why there weren't people there already. And so he says, okay, you, you choose, even though Abraham is being very gracious here. So, of course, Lot, I shouldn't say of course, Lot chose, I'm going to take the good land. But with the good land also came people who were worshiping unlike Lot. So how can, we learn, how can we learn to be kind and generous to others even when they aren't that way to us? Any ideas? There's always crisis, There's always crisis yeah. So if we want to learn to be kind and generous to others that are unkind and not generous, you know what God has to do in our lives? He has to bring into our lives people who are unkind and not generous so that we can learn how to work, be with, to, um, how we can learn to, get to, to work with them. So, I mean, to me, that sounds like, I, I'm not sure I like that. Much like if I wanted to win a bodybuilding contest, which I don't think my physique would ever allow that, because uh, I've always been slender and I'm the, probably the slenderest of six sons out of eight children. But if I did want to do that, I would have to do a lot of weightlifting and go through some pain and be rigorous about my diet and lots of other things. That's how that happens. Now, once you get fit, you don't have to necessarily work as hard. Maintaining fitness isn't the same as getting to fitness. Once you're fit, it takes less effort. You can maintain it. Uh, similar to other things. If you let your house start falling down around your ears and don't paint it for 30 years and the wood starts warping and the wood, and it, it takes a lot of repair. Whereas if you just were to maintain your house and keep it painted, it'd be a lot less effort. It's the same thing with your body and the same thing those physical things have an application in our lives. It's the same thing, same way. So just remember, when you have faced challenges in your life, you can look at that as a problem. You can also look at it as an opportunity. This is an opportunity for God to work in you and to develop something in you so that you... And another thing that I've thought about is once you have that skill set, and are skilled at working with people in these scenarios, now God can bring a lot of those people into your lives. And you're like, well, initially that might be a problem when you're not ready. But once you're trained, then it's a breeze. It's still a problem. It still creates strife in your life. But if you're trusting in God and, you ha and he's helped you develop that skill set, it's way easier, much like the maintenance part, right? That's the maintenance part of the, of the plan. So then Lot is taken captive, right? We fast forward, Lot's taken captive. These four kings got together and they, you know, Lot, it, Lot wasn't the target. He just happened to, he was collateral damage, you could say. And Abram thinking, whoa, that's my, that's my nephew and his family. And even though we've separated, even though he, I still have to, I'm sure that God, at this point, Abram's praying about it. And he leads 400 men against four armies. Which doesn't sound like a very sane decision, does it? Normally you check how many people you have, how many people they have. I don't think that's the plan Abram followed. I think the plan he followed is, God's going to bless me with whatever I have. I happen to have 400 men. We're going to take, we're going to go. 
goes and they rescue Lot and several other people. And it doesn't tell us if he fought against everyone or what the deal is. I don't know that that's important, but he rescued Lot's and his family and others. So did that take faith? Yeah. And had God been helping Abraham develop his faith? Yes. He had brought him problems. He brought him the famine where he went into Egypt and had some things that shouldn't have happened. He comes back. He starts acting more in faith. And so here's this opportunity. And then with that opportunity, so how do you develop faith like that? Well, from day to day. You, you work on it daily. So then Abraham meets the king of Salem on returning from the rescue mission. So I kind of get the impression the king of Salem, he was not actively involved in the rescue plan. I'm pretty sure Abraham was right there with his men. So the king asks only for the people, not the things. He says, like, hey, you brought my people. I just want my, my people. The thing is, the king of Salem had no right for, from anything. Everything that's, that happened with, with that rescue, by rights, by their local code, their local laws, their culture... That was all Abraham. He gets to keep it all. But we know a little bit about Abraham already, right? He left Ur of Chaldees where it was uh, comfortable, really nice living. They had indoor plumbing. They had two-story houses. He leaves all that to go live in a tent, doesn't even know where he's going, has some problems. Then he comes up against this, and Abraham tells the king he doesn't want to keep so much as a shoelace. He doesn't say shoelace in the Bible. I'm translating. He, the, Abraham's men do get to keep some of the spoils. That was according to the local code too. And those who guarded the camp. Even the people who stayed behind to guard and didn't take the greatest risk, they still got their piece. And then we, it introduced, the story introduced to somebody named Melchizedek, who is re, later... This is a type of Jesus. It's interesting because we don't know much about Melchizedek. He just kind of comes out of nowhere. In fact, he's not even Hebrew. And I'm like, wait. Um, Abraham paid tithe to somebody, to a priest he didn't really know. Not even part of his tribe. He's just this unknown guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to pause here because previously I just said Abraham said he wasn't going to keep anything. He kept enough to pay a tithe. So he did keep something. One of the things that Abraham didn't do is he did not want to, he didn't want the king of Salem or anybody else to get the impression I went and rescued, did that rescue mission so that I could increase my wealth. I mean, he didn't need to increase his wealth. He was already wealthy. So he didn't see this as a golden opportunity to, you know, make his wealth even greater. He, he saw it as, I'm on a rescue mission. By chance, he ended up with things and people. So tithing is an act of faith, isn't it? So going back to our, from our soccer player, according to the code of the world, he who has the gold makes the rules. But according to the golden rule, do unto others, we looked at that in Luke, do to other people, that's God's code. Those two codes don't, they are opposite ends of the spectrum. So tithing, when God asks us to tithe, in fact, it says it doesn't say pay your tithe. Do you realize that? It doesn't, well, it might, but it's actually called returning your tithe. So if I borrow, if I borrow something from Jerry and I return it to her, was it mine or did I just have it? I just had it. And God says, 
you are mine. I know that for, I mean, I grew up in America. I have an American culture and mindset. Just like Abraham had the Hammurabi code, and that's why later in the stories, they have, we're going to see in the next coming lessons how they said, well, if you can't have a son, then you can have a son, you can take one of your servants, and you can make him your, your son, even though he's not lineage. And another option is you can take your wife's handmaiden. And one of the things I found interesting was, I don't know if this is going to be covered or not, but um, is it Hagar, I think is her name? Uh, she, was, she was Egyptian, I think. So remember when he went to Egypt and he made a mistake, God helped point it out, and when they sent him on their way, they're like, whoever you're worshiping, we don't want to mess with that. Anybody who can make people either stop having babies or stop getting pregnant, we don't want any part of it. We don't want to anger them. And so they said, not only, you know, could you leave, like, here's some gifts, like, and then adios amigos, right? Just go. So I, I'm, I'm kind of wondering, if, if I put it together, it doesn't say in the story, that maybe this Egyptian handmaiden was a gift from the king to Sarah. So even though by the, war, the world standard it makes no sense, tithing, is it an example, uh, is God's example to us hoarding or is God's example to us sharing? Sharing. He gave his son, he created, he's constantly seeking us, he's chasing us as a, as a lover. For anyone who's uh, been in love or, or uh, wanted to date something, you know, they have the, that, that period where, where they call it puppy love or they call it uh, infatuation, right? Which is not, it's a thing. It's chemically a thing. Like it happens. You're just head over heels over someone and you can't see everything about them. You can only see the best about them. So when we, God chases us like a lover who's infatuated, he is, he's crazy about us. He'd have to be in order to do what he did and all the effort he's putting into saving us. That's the only explanation I can come up with. That's what fits, that makes sense. And if somebody who cares about you that much, is there some way that he's saying, okay, let's, how do we respond to that? Do we do that by saying, great, you gave me stuff and now let's hang on to it. So we have a few minutes left. What did we learn? God wants us to be faithful to him even when it doesn't make sense. Does it make sense? Did it make sense to Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and on a trip where he had no known destination? No, it didn't. But that's what God asked him to do. And now we have that story because Abraham was faithful. God can make good come out of what wasn't good. So God didn't, you know, Abraham had some missteps. And he was faithful. He left. He went on his journey. But he made some mistakes on his way. And God turned those things that were not good into good. I think that's a good message for us to know even when we make mistakes, it's not like you're out. It's not game over. Remember, God's that lover who's chasing us. He's infatuated with us. He thinks we're awesome. What God does in our lives to bless us isn't only for us. In fact, he wants us to be the conduit for his love to others. 
So if we're, if we're not doing that, we might want to rethink how we're doing our lives. Because that was the example Jesus gave. And it's the example you can go through the whole Bible and look for those examples of those who did and those who didn't. Uh, you think of the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. Clearly had a communication with God. Otherwise, they wouldn't have you know, necessarily been talking like that. And God gives him a mission, and he goes the other way. And God still turned it around and said, we're still going to make this work out, right? But God wanted to bless Nineveh, and he sent Jonah to do it. And Jonah, being a thoughtful individual, realized those people are evil, and they might kill me, you know, because they're not really good people. He didn't... He might have wanted them dead. The spirit of Jonah was he really didn't want them to be saved. He, he even said that to God. He said, I know you're merciful, and I know you're going to save him. He was angry that God was saving Nineveh. That's an interesting thought. So what does that say about our spirit if we look at other people and say, well, I'm not sure that they're ready to be saved? I mean, right now the world may be, maybe not Russians, but... The rest of the world might be looking at Putin and saying, he's not worth saving. What do you think God thinks about that? Do you think God thinks Putin's worth saving? Well, maybe, maybe not, because he also wanted uh, Saul to kill everybody of the Ammonites, uh, you know, Amalekites, because, you know. But that was an instruction, though. I'm saying we are not, I don't have an instruction to kill Putin. I'm, I'm just saying, my point is, if we look at some people and we say they're not worth saving, I don't know that that's my decision, unless God gives me that specific instruction. That's, that's where I was going with that. So faith is not a one-time action. It's something we do daily, moment by moment. You know, faith is not something you just decide, you know, today I'm going to be a Christian, and then that's the decision, and um, I know... Being a man, I make this mistake. I got married. I told my wife I love her. What else does she want? Uh, on, on, you know, occasionally I need to remind her because, you know, it's important for her. It's not important for me. I already know that. Uh, we talked in the first part of the lesson, do you want to make a name for yourself? God already has a name for you. No need to do that. And he's got a much better, you look at the Bible story, he's got a much better plan than people think up. We don't think big enough. And if you make a mistake, talk it over with God. He wants to keep the lines of communication open. Those are the things we see in these lessons from Genesis and about Abraham and Lot. Our lesson next week is the covenant with Abraham, and I don't remember who's presenting, but I'm looking forward to it. You see the picture there. What was his covenant? God's promise to him is your. So here's, here's Abraham, still no son. 100 years, he gets promises multiple times. You're going to have offspring, and he's got no son. Now, Abraham kind of screwed this up too. He made some mistakes. But remember I said that God can make good. One-fifth of the world population is Muslim. I think God loves Muslims. I don't think he loves some of the things that they believe where they're so very harsh, because that's not who God is. But I think God still loves them, and he still wants them. So here's this covenant with Abraham. You are going, your name, and we're still talking about him today as this character from the, from the Old Testament. Let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, <clears throat> today we've looked at things about Abraham and the example that he gives us, the example that you want us to be faithful to you. We don't always understand it. Help us to follow you in faith, in, in your leadings, so that we can bless others and that they too can be in your kingdom. We want that for ourselves. We want to take that and be just like you and desire that for others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.